like father, like son, is the title of today's message taken from Genesis chapter 26. We have two thoughts. They are failure, verse 1 to 11, and God's abounding grace from verses 12 to 35. Fathers and sons may resemble each other. And sons tend to do what their fathers did before them. We <clears throat> see this parallel in the life of Abraham and his son Isaac. Both were men with whom God covenanted to bless for his purpose of mankind's redemption. And both had the same spiritual weakness, a lack of faith to do the truthful thing, though it means certain danger. We realize that we are very much uh, a part of the corruption that has entered human history as a result of the fall of Adam and Eve, the corrupt nature needed to be renewed by the Spirit of God. And the Bible, we would see, recording truthfully the weaknesses of men for our learning so that we are not under any illusion that when we are saved, we though have that ability to choose not to sin, and yet when temptation comes, we can yield if we are not filled with the Spirit of God. The story of Abraham and Isaac's well, stumble when they were faced with intimidation. You'd find a story for our learning and relearning as a lesson of faith in our lives. Both encountered, as our text tells us, severe testing and failed. But their God intervened to protect them. What was their failure? Well, it's interesting that both encountered severe famine. When famine comes, when there, was, there is no food, when life is held at ransom, what will be our response in the face of certain danger of real depravity? Well, you see <clears throat> that our writer reminded us in verse 1 of that parallel in Genesis 12, verse 9 to 20, when Abraham first arrived in Canaan, there was a famine. And our story begins here in Genesis 26, also with a famine. You recall, Abraham went to Egypt. Did God instruct him to go to Egypt? Well, God's call for him was to come to a land, the land of Canaan, and to dwell there. And God has promised to them that He would take care of them. How is it that Abraham failed the Lord when in the time of the famine, he defied God, went down to Egypt, 
in the case of Isaac, God clearly intervened. In the history of the Jews, you'd find God's people seeking refuge in Egypt twice. Jacob's family was provided with food through his son Joseph in Genesis 46, which we would learn and see later on. And the story of Mary and Joseph with baby Jesus in Matthew chapter 2, when King Herod made a decree to kill all the babies, the young ones that were born, the Lord instructed Jesus or Mary and Joseph to bring the baby Jesus to hide there in Egypt. So Egypt was a place of refuge on these occasions. But God's Word also tells us to stay away from Egypt because it has the meaning of the world. Egypt, a place of the world, a place of idolatry, a place of prosperity, but a place of godlessness. You see, in our memory verse, Isaiah 31 verse 1, describing for us that danger. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horses because they are very strong. Isn't it so? We look to things that are strong and we gravitate towards it for we find in it an obvious security. But in the realm of God, security is in Him. And the Lord wants us to learn that lesson in our walk with Him. Isaiah 31 one says, They look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Rather, they look at the very strong horses and trust in the chariots. In other words, trust in the strength of this world, trust in our own strength. To rely upon Egypt for help is to liken to putting our trust in our own understanding rather than following the will of God. Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 7. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It is a shifting of our trust and security in God to trusting in human strength and wisdom or simply human resources. See, what was the problem with Abraham going to Egypt? Well, It was that God did not instruct him to go there. It was not in the will of God. He would face danger there. And as we have learned in the life of Abraham, that visit to Egypt was very costly for him. Not just for him, but his family. You recall, out of Egypt came Hagar, the handmaid, out of which came Ishmael, the son. Out of Egypt also came forth a tainted mindset 
upon the nephew Lot, who for the first time was exposed to the world and its fatal attractions. Well, it cost Lot and his family greatly. It was a lifetime loss for Abraham making that journey to Egypt. And so you see here, God intervened. God intervened for Isaac that he should not go down to Egypt. And he did not. But here, we are speaking about reality. There was no food on the table. We are hungry. What do you do? Well, here, the people of God is instructed that we are first to seek the Lord and His face, to seek the guidance of the Lord for he will surely provide a way of refuge for you in his will. And so Isaac, the man in charge now, has to learn that lesson. And our text tells us in verse 1 of, Genesis 26. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gera. Well, he went south to the, this place called Gera. And there God intervened. God intervened. What did the Lord say to Isaac? The Lord said to him in verse 2, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. So God has a land, a place for your care, for your protection, for your sustenance, that he wants you to know so that you may abide there for your blessing. This was that place for Isaac. And Isaac heard the voice of God. God said to him, Sojourn in this land and I will tell, I'll be with thee and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as stars of heaven. And give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. What a great promise that God uttered to him in the time of his lack, it was a time of famine. He knew that he needed the subsistence for not himself, but the large family that he is responsible to care for. And the Lord surely knows our need. He understands our frame. And so our text tells us in verse 5, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, so shall you. And Isaac hearkened to the voice of the Lord. He dwelt in Gira. So that was a good first step. Right? Abraham 
failed. He went down to Egypt without consulting the Lord. But the son, God intervened. He listened. And verse 7, And the man of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She is my sister. For he feared to say, She is my wife. Lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. Well, there came that same, well, we said, mistake that was made. Isaac went to Gira, where the Philistines lived an area where Abraham had also sojourned. We saw this in Genesis 20. And he lied a second time there that Sarah was his wife. He lied one time in Egypt when he went down to Egypt, defying the voice of God. And the second time, 25 years later, to this king of that region, Abimelech. And it was a time when well, he was quite old, and yet uh, he made that same mistake twice. And verse 7 of our text says, And the men of the place asked him of his wife and said, She is my sister. For he feared to say, She is my wife. Now, at that point, you see that deception that Abraham, his father, repeated to, in his lifetime, was repeated by his son, Abimelech. She said, Rebekah was her wife because he was afraid that they would do harm toward him and the family. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she's my sister. Right, you recall? In Genesis 26. And so, in that time, uh, you see how Abraham was just like us, a sinner saved by grace, prone to lapses of faith, to live by our own understanding rather than by faith you would see how human and fallible we are as you look at this folly of Isaac. We are capable of making mistakes. And in this passage, we learn how the Bible records true-to-life experience of God's people that we can identify with. And from it, we learn precious lessons of faith, how we can order our lives aright. Abraham repeated his mistake. But God intervened. God gave Abimelech a dream by night to reveal to him that the woman was the wife, the man's wife. And so God intervened to protect Sarah. That was 25 years after Abraham arrived in Canaan. God was there. They were faithless. It was the will of God that Sarah will bear the descendant of Abraham in a future time. It was the will of God that Rebekah will also bear the descendant of the line of the Messiah. And so God 
intervene despite their failures. What a gracious God. And how weak we see we can be. God used an unbeliever to correct his servant. How embarrassing it is. What a shame to the testimony for a man of God to be chided by a heathen for telling lies. And the Bible recorded it for us so that we may learn that we would be truthful. But you see how God's hand was there protecting and keeping Abraham, protecting and keeping Isaac. God did not condone the sin of Abraham, but God overruled it by revealing to Abimelech the truth that Sarah is Abraham's wife. And for Isaac's case, what happened? Well, <laughs> Abimelech saw, uh, verse 8 of our text tells us, Isaac sporting with Rebekah, his wife. So God exposed their deception for their good. For Abraham's case, it was a dream. But for Isaac's case, well, it was a witness. They were quite closely together and Abimelech saw it and said, surely this man and this woman must have a special relationship. And so he called him in. And Abimelech called, verse 9, Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety she is thy wife. How sayest thou that she is my sister? Ah, exposed. Exposed. Couldn't hide the lie. And Isaac said to him, Because I said, Lest I die for her. That was the reason. Well, he was honest about it. And Abimelech said, What is this that thou hast done unto us? Do you know how dangerous it would be for us to fall under the wrath of God for doing the wrong thing because you did not tell us? Although things may be hidden from men, right, we see from this episode that it is not hidden from the eyes of God. God sees. God knows. And if you are a child of God, He intervenes for your sake because He loves you. It is not uh, a scene for us to condone what Abraham, Isaac did, but rather of the grace of God. Then in spite of their weaknesses, God protected them. When we come under the care of God, you know that the Lord is with you, to care for you. Right? We were describing this to our folks. The Lord Jesus Christ, after He has completed His work of redemption upon the cross, rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, what is He doing? At the right hand of the Father, praying for us. And we say this, that, you know, you try praying for somebody, Five minutes, half an hour, 
one hour, two hours, three hours. Oh, the Lord prays unceasingly at the right hand of the Father for us. Hard work, you know. His care for you, He cares for us. It's most, uh, it's in the fullest sense of the word. He doesn't want us to fall by the wayside, make mistakes, step on the landmines of life and be hurt. And so you see here how the Lord intervened. Abimelech said, What has this the stand that thou hast done unto us? One of the people might have lightly have lain with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. And Abimelech charged all the people, saying, He that touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. God protected Isaac and protected Rebekah. You know, they are just a, a group, a family of nomadic wanderers in a predative land whom God has called them to reside. So anything can happen we have a God in heaven who cares for us and who has covenanted to protect you, to bless you when you place your faith and trust in Him. What a privilege we have as God's people. Why not live a life that is pleasing in His sight? Did Isaac have to lie? No, he did not have to lie. He could simply just tell Abimelech, this is my wife. And that closes the matter, right? But he did not. Same for Abraham. And we are good at what you know, the world would call transactional analysis. We learn to think and think by our wisdom, by our understanding and formulate an outcome. But that's not the way with God. With God, we do what is right in His sight. And we leave the outcome to Him. We do what is right in His sight. And we leave the outcome to Him. We are willing to trust Him with the outcome by doing what is right in His sight. So, there are life lessons that Abraham learned that Isaac had to relearn. Right? He was, uh, as it were, scolded point blank <laughs> uh, by this heathen king. God protected the family. In a time of famine, God provided for them. Verse 20, verse 12 says, Then Isaac sold in that land, and received in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him a hundredfold, a hundred times. How the Lord was with the man, how the Lord was there to care for Isaac. Because we have a covenant-keeping God. 
He undertakes to save us and promise us, promise to bring us to heaven. He never fails. Despite our weaknesses for His own purpose and glory. Here we see Isaac followed in the sin which his father had twice committed, telling untruth regarding his wife. Rebekah was fair as Sarah had been. Isaac feared for his life. He spread the word that Rebekah was his sister, a deception that was still more serious than Abraham's. For <clears throat> Sarah, Abraham said, she's my half-sister. And it was some time later that Gira, the ruler in Gira, Abimelech, learned of that deception and warned his people. You see how we are so weak, but there is no excuse not to walk in the Spirit. Numbers 32 verse 23 says, Behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and your sin will find you out. God comes after us. God came after Isaac. His sin was exposed when his sin was pointed out. He offered inadequate excuses, showing his weak faith. Although Abraham's eyes were off the Lord, but the Lord's eyes was never off Abraham. He intervened to save Abraham to ensure that Sarah would give the progenitor of the Hebrew race. And we see here God's faithfulness, Abraham's faithlessness. So it was with Isaac. Abimelech discovered Isaac's lie. Truly, our sins will find us out. The truth is out. He was exposed for his deception. We have to be careful how we lived our lives for those whom we bring with us, especially those of our children, will learn from us whether they are good or whether they are evil. Parents are to set a good example for their children. We see God's abounding grace from verse 12 to 35 when Isaac stayed in Gira, accepted Abimelech's hospitality, planted crops, ripped a bountiful harvest. And there were jealousies that happened there with the people of the land, Abimelech's men uh, took away all their sustenance, the wells which were digged uh, will destroyed. And the Lord appeared to Isaac was, uh, to, to help him, to guide him, as he did with Abraham. You see, we are not alone as the people of God. And God knows our needs. And God blessed Isaac with great increase so that the people of, Ab of Abimelech would come to Isaac to seek a peace treaty. Verse 27, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me, have sent me away from you. And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord is with thee. We saw certainly that the Lord is with thee. 
You see, if you walk with God, you trust God, God takes care of you. And it is visible even to the world. They know. They can see. And how the Lord took care. How the Lord protected. Our story ends in verse 34. The children of Isaac, he had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And here is recorded a sad note. Uh, Esau was 40 years old and he took a wife of the daughter of the land. And it grieved the heart of Isaac and Rebekah. An unhappy episode when Isaac and Rebekah could not stop their son from marrying outside the covenant. The failure in every generation. You see weaknesses, but you also see God's abounding grace. These are thoughts for our consideration that we have a God who takes care. And there is a covenant by which God entrusts to fathers and mothers the care of their next generation. And we have that responsibility and duty toward the nurturing, the care of the next generation. And you would see that is best done by a good example. In other words, we have to practice the faith ourselves. We have to do what is right so that the generation after may see and they may learn a right lesson from us. May the Lord help us. May God bless covenant families that the faith may be passed from one generation to another generation for his own honour and glory. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for thy word. Strengthen us by thy grace and comfort us by thy Holy Spirit. Strengthen thy people. This we pray with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name. Amen.